This is Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you're listening in today. Hey, joining me on today's program is first-time guest, Mr. Jim Welsh. Uh, Jim is a fundamental and technical analyst. We're going to get his take on where all markets go from this point on. Uh, as I said, Jim is a first-time guest. He's got a couple of free reports he's offering the listeners today. I will be chatting with Jim in segments two and three of today's program. If you have not yet requested the free Retirement Roadmap book, this is a best-selling book that I wrote back in 2021. It is now being made available at no cost. It contains some retirement planning strategies, in particular tax planning strategies that you may want to check out after the SECURE Act was passed. To get your free copy of Retirement Roadmap, as well as some bonus information, all you need to do is visit the website, requestyourreport.com. The website, again, requestyourreport.com. When you visit the website, you just have to let us know where to mail your complimentary copy of the book, and we'll be glad to do so. And on that topic, thanks to all of you that uh, helped put my latest book, Winning Strategies, on the bestseller list. Winning Strategies was a number one bestseller in two categories when it was released just a few weeks ago. And that book, if you're interested, is available on Amazon. We also have a free website. You do need to create a login, but it is free. It is at retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. When you go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com and create a free login, you'll get access to the weekly podcast. You'll get access to the weekly headline roundup newscast that I do. You'll also get the weekly newsletter, and that's all free at retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. I don't know how many of you saw that the Wall Street Journal ran a story last week, and the journal reported that food prices rose at the fastest rate in 18 months. Now, month over month, Food prices rose, and month over month is from August to September. Month over month, food prices rose 3%. This comes on the heels of the Fed cutting interest rates a half a percent and essentially taking a victory lap that inflation is under control. This Wall Street Journal story seems to run contrary to the Fed's position. Now, the data that the journal reported comes from the Food and Agricultural Organization at the United Nations. As I said, month over month, food prices were up 3%. Sugar prices led the way. Sugar prices up 10.4% in September. Cereal prices up 3%. Dairy prices up 3.8%. Vegetable oil up 4.6%. Now, the article pointed to growing conditions and transportation interruptions as the cause of the price increases. However, it's my view that the primary cause of these price increases remains the easy money policies that have been pursued by world central banks, and now we're headed down that road again. And now, as I mentioned at the outset of this segment, after the recent pivot by the Fed, after the Fed started to cut interest rates, I am looking for even more price inflation moving ahead, and I'm also looking for higher interest rates moving ahead. Speaking of central banks, maybe you saw the report that Bank of America put out. Bank of America reported that gold is now the second largest reserve asset of central banks. It was the euro. The U.S. dollar, of course, remains the largest central bank reserve asset. It was followed by the euro, but now the euro is no longer in second place. Gold is now in second place. The yellow metal represents 16% of global bank reserves. The U.S. dollar still represents 58% of reserve assets. Now, that is a commanding share. Almost 6 60%, 58% of all central bank reserves are still in the U.S. dollar. However, it's down 70% since 
from 2002. The country of Russia recently announced that she will increase daily purchases of gold, daily purchases of gold from 1.2 billion rubles to 8.2 billion rubles, and those are gold purchases per day. Now, for those of you that don't instantly know the rubles to U.S. dollar comparison, let me help you out. The dollar equivalent is $13.5 million per day to $90 million per day in gold purchases. Russia is funding these gold purchases using windfall oil and gas profits. So Russia is converting its profits from oil and gas, which are tangible natural resource assets, to gold, which is also a tangible asset. Poland was the largest buyer of gold in the second quarter of this year. And in the past, when the Polish Central Bank bought gold, it would store the gold in other places. No more. Poland is insisting that the gold be delivered to the country and they're storing it within the, the borders of Poland. Now, many of you are also aware that we do have the BRICS Summit. For those of you that are new listeners and you don't know about BRICS, BRICS is an acronym standing for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. There are now many oil-producing countries that are also part of BRICS. There is a BRICS Summit that will be held in Russia later this month the 22nd to the 24th. And like we saw last year, there are rumors that the BRICS coalition will be unveiling a new trade currency, perhaps gold-backed. Now, I've done a fair amount of research on this. I've been unable to find anything concrete. Everything that I'm seeing at this point is speculative. But should the BRICS countries roll out a trade currency that is gold-backed or backed by commodities, that will likely continue to be very bullish for metals. Some of you probably also saw the most recent jobs report. In fact, there were some politicians touting the jobs report, saying that there were 254,000 jobs created the unemployment rate fell, which all seems like good news, at least on the surface. However, when you dig into the report, you find the number of government workers surged by 3%. This was the largest monthly surge in government workers on record. In fact, the number of government workers added Per the most recent jobs report, when you do the math, it made the reported unemployment rate 4.1%. If these government jobs were not added, the unemployment rate would have been 4.5%. So think about that for a minute. Without increased government workers, the unemployment rate would now be 4.5%. But because the government added all these workers, the reported unemployment rate is now only 4.1%. Incidentally, if you're wondering how all these new jobs are being funded, you really don't need to look any further than outstanding U.S. government debt. U.S. government debt, once again, hit record highs. This, I believe, will, this, this increased debt, the fact that we have now reached a point that we're borrowing money to pay interest on money that we have already borrowed. I believe we're getting very close to what I would call an inflection point. And I believe that this will likely continue to be very bullish for gold and silver moving ahead. Also this past week, in the time I have left in this segment, I found that the International Monetary Fund openly discussed a concept that they call financial repression. It's really a playbook for what's going on. This is from the International Monetary Fund, and I quote, 
Financial repression includes directed lending to government by captive domestic audiences such as pension funds, explicit or implicit caps on interest rates, regulations of cross-border capital movements, and generally a tighter connection between government and banks. High public debt often produces the drama of default and restructuring. But debt is also reduced through financial repression, a tax on bondholders and savers via negative or below market real interest rates. Financial repression is most successful in liquidating debt when accompanied by inflation. In other words, people, entities investing in government bonds like pension If they receive an interest rate that is lower than the real inflation rate, the government is able to borrow in dollars and pay back in dimes. That's exactly what is going on and exactly why you might want to get the Retirement Roadmap book available by visiting requestyourreport.com. It contains some tax-saving strategies to potentially remove some of your IRA favorably from the tax system. So to request your book, Go to requestyourreport.com. I'll be glad to send it to you. Again, the website, requestyourreport.com. I'll be back after these words with my special guest, Mr. Jim Welsh. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Joining me on today's program is first-time guest, Mr. Jim Welsh. Uh, Jim is a uh, prolific analyst and author. He uh, writes Macro Tides, uh, which is a uh, a monthly overview of what's going on in the economy and the markets, and he also writes a monthly or a weekly rather technical update. Uh, all around bright guy and uh, first time guest here on the program. And uh, Jim, excited to have you on the program, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for the kind words, Dennis. I'm glad to be here. So, Jim, let us just start, uh, and I'll mention too as as we get going here. If anybody would like to learn more about Jim's work macrotides.com is the website and uh, jim has been gracious enough to offer a couple of free reports that we'll talk about over the next couple of segments one is titled 17 year cycle the other is titled the coming secular bear market if you want to email jim welsh macro at gmail.com he'll be happy to send you one or both reports and i'll mention that again before the segment is over so jim let's talk a little bit here um uh, The Fed seems to have here just a few weeks ago taken a victory lap, claiming that inflation now has been tamed and uh, it's time to start cutting interest rates and reversing course. Um, Do you think that's the case uh, or what might be the uh, alternate motivation for the Fed's recent action? Well, listening to what Chair Powell has said, Dennis, as well as really looking at the minutes of the meetings, What has become clear over the last two, three months is that both the Hawks on the FOMC and the Doves agreed that the federal funds rate was restrictive if you look at it in terms of where inflation is and from a historical standpoint. So that's why the Fed moved to lower the funds rate by 50 basis points. They also emphasize, and Chair Powell did this, I think, uh, very clearly, that any changes going forward are going to be dictated by economic data. Uh, the, the Fed penciled in two more quarter point decreases at the November and then the December meeting. Uh, but Wall Street, as it typically does, Dennis, as you well know, uh, you know, where they're looking for more. <laughs> you know, we're going to get more. So the recent uh, GDP data, ISM services data that came out that was better than expected, and then of course the employment report better than expected. All those things kind of say the Fed is taking the data in, and it certainly uh, suggests that they're not going to be as aggressive as Wall Street expected. So I think, again, what they're intending to do is very gradually reduce uh, the gap between where inflation is uh, and where the funds rate is over time. They're in no rush to do this because the unemployment rate's still really low and the economy is still on a pretty decent footing. So Jim, what is your take? What's your forecast for where inflation goes from here? Uh, Does this fuel more inflation in your view? There's a risk of that, Dennis. And what we've seen in the last week or so, recent developments, obviously 
if something that happens in the Middle East restricts uh, Iran's, uh, Iran's ability to export oil, uh, all of a sudden we could see higher energy prices. Uh, we've already seen natural gas have a pretty good move up in the last month. Food prices in terms of grain prices hit really decade lows. Uh, just a few weeks ago, they've been rebounding. And then, again, this is why I think the Fed is proceeding cautiously. They know and they've talked about what happened in the 1970s, where the East policy, uh, let me back up, they aggressively tightened policy. It caused a recession, which forced them to ease policy before inflation was really uh, low. And the net result is inflation kept ramping higher. So uh, again, I think the Fed is trying to split the difference between uh, cutting too aggressively or not cutting enough. And it's going to be a tough balancing act because as I think you're implying with your question, Dennis, there still are inflationary risks. We've never had a budget deficit of 7% when the economy was growing at 25 to 3%. You know, in times like the pandemic, uh, the the uh, uh, financial crisis, yes, the deficit was over 7% uh, during those periods of time, but never when the economy is growing the way it is. So that is another risk that the Fed faces is that as long as the government keeps spending money at the clip they are, it provides uh, an underlying support for the economy, which then implies too that uh, inflation maybe a bit more stubborn in coming down to their target. Well, Jim, you mentioned the deficit. And if you're just tuning in, I'm chatting today with Mr. Jim Welsh. Uh, you can learn more about his work at macrotides.com. And Jim has been gracious enough to offer the listeners a couple of free reports today, the 17-year cycle and the coming secular bear market. You can email Jim at jimwelshmacro at gmail.com. That's jimwelshmacro at gmail.com. He'll be happy to send you those reports uh, absolutely free. So, uh, Jim, when, when you look at uh, the, the the deficit and the debt, uh, there, there's a stat I read recently that's pretty alarming. Um, you know, we're, we, we have a $2 trillion operating deficit, roughly, and the U.S. government has to finance about $16 trillion in debt, or I should say refinance $16 trillion in debt over the next three years. In today's environment, with all the private sector debt that is out there as well, that seems like a Herculean task. Um, are, are we going to see a severe recession or a, a severe deflationary period over the next few years? And, and, and can that be done? Uh, well, it's a great question. What I will tell you is, again, and you referenced it at the beginning, I combine fundamental analysis, which obviously is the basis of your question, with technical analysis. And one of the things I've written about over the last year is if you look at the 30-year treasury bond or the ETF TLT, um, from their highs in March of 2020, there is a clear five-wave decline. Now, from a chart analysis perspective, and I know this probably sounds a little Greekish to a lot of the folks that aren't familiar with that kind of stuff, but what it told me last October Dennis, was that we were going to see Treasury yields decline. Now, back then, as you might remember, people were talking the 10 years is going to five and a quarter, five and a half. It peaked just under 5%. We have indeed seen Treasury yields decline. Um, and if I'm right, that the economy shows more signs of slowing and a recession develops next year, I think Treasury yields are going to continue to decline. And whenever the economy goes into recession, mutual funds, insurance companies will buy treasury paper because they want to lock in the higher yields. So in the short run, if we have economic softening and or a recession, uh, the supply that you're referencing can be, I think, absorbed. The problem then becomes, if indeed a recession happens, the $2 tr trillion deficit will become $3 trillion or more. And I think there's a light bulb that then goes on somewhere out there, whether it's next year or the year after, where people will, in fact, and the markets will choke on the supply of paper. So that five-wave decline in TLT in the 30-year Treasury bond tells me uh, that, okay, we're going to see a window of time where Treasury yields decline. 
But then that's going to be followed, Dennis, by another increase in yields that will take them higher than what we saw at the peak last October. And I think the 10-year could get up towards 7.5%. So uh, this, again, is where combining technical analysis with fundamentals can really improve tactical positioning in various markets like treasury bonds. So you are not a fan of uh, holding long-term U.S. treasuries uh, for a, a longer-term duration as you think rates are going to be going back up again or yields will be going back up. Yeah, basically, to me, it's a trade, Dennis, that uh, I think uh, the, the tick up in yields, which I started writing about two weeks ago, that I thought that we would see treasury yields increase, obviously has come to pass. Uh, I think that you know well, it's creating a buying opportunity for a trade, but you're 100% right. From a longer term perspective, people who buy and hold treasury bonds, I think are not gonna be happy with the results. So Jim, in the time we have left, could you please talk a little bit about the reports you're offering the listeners? Maybe uh, the 17 year cycle, uh, when someone emails you at jimwelshmacro at gmail.com and requests that report, what might they learn? What they're gonna learn is that going back uh, to 1939, the S&P has had a peak and then suffered an, uh, at least a 20% decline. Uh, after the peak in 1939, peak in 1956, in 1973, the decline was more than 45%, 1990 was over 20%, 2007 uh, was 57%. Well, what's 17 years from uh, 2007, 2024? So my take, uh, Dennis, has been is that, all right, we're approaching what could be a fairly significant top, at least from a cyclical standpoint, sometime in 2024. As that piece also describes, the advanced decline line has been a, a pretty good assistant in terms of identifying when that decline was likely to unfold. Historically, when the S&P makes a new high and the advanced decline line also makes a new high, the market is in pretty good shape. In other words, could you get a 10% decline? Of course, but big declines don't usually happen. Last week, the advanced decline line did make a new all-time high. So near term, I think the market can have a pullback, but I'm waiting for the that other shoe to fall into place where the S&P makes a higher high, but the advanced decline line uh, makes a lower high. That, in my mind, will pinpoint when we're likely to see the S&P roll over and then begin a climb of 20% or more. If we get a recession next year, the average decline has been 35% whenever the S&P has experienced a recession. So the history suggests we should be on guard for a high, and technical analysis is just attempting, if you will, to pinpoint when the turn is coming. Well, my guest today is Mr. Jim Welsh. If you'd like to get the report that uh, Jim just described, you can email Jim at Jim Welsh. That is spelled W-E-L-S-H, Jim Welsh Macro at gmail.com. The good news is I have one more segment with Jim. We'll chat with him after these words. Stay with us. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. I'm chatting today with Mr. Jim Welsh. Uh, you can learn more about Jim's work at macrotides.com. He is a prolific analyst from the fundamental and technical perspective, one of the few analysts to marry those two disciplines together. And uh, Jim, prior to the break, you talked a bit about the report that you're offering our listeners today, set the 17-year cycle. There's also another report that has a bit of an ominous title, The Coming Secular Bear Market. I'm going to have you describe that, but just in case uh, we have somebody who's just tuning in, you can request those reports for free from Jim at jimwelshmacro at gmail.com. Just send him an email at jimwelshmacro at gmail.com. So can you talk a bit about the coming secular bear market, that uh, title is kind of uh, self-descriptive. <laughs> uh, it is. But again, the stock market is like a pendulum, Dennis, and it swings you know, from one extreme to the other. And we've been enjoying secular bull markets on balance since 1932, obviously since 2009, 2020. Uh, but there's been in history these windows of time where the market makes no progress or goes down a fair amount. 1966 
1982 is certainly one of those times. Even 2000 to 2009, a 10-year window where the S&P made no progress. So my point is, talking about a secular bear market isn't like, gee, this never happened before. It has happened numerous times over the last 100, 150 years. Secondly, valuations are very, very extended. Uh, now, the market doesn't go down just because it's expensive. There has to be a reason to sell in order to, if you will, negate the long bias institutional uh, mindset. Institutions buy and hold. In individual investors are told, buy and hold. And during secular bear markets, that's great advice, has worked out very well. But when you enter a secular bear market phase, Dennis, the market just doesn't keep making higher highs. It either goes sideways and also experiences very sharp decline. So if anybody's listening, pull up a chart of the Dow from 1966 to 1982. Uh, that chart is included, of course, in the piece, but it'll give you a, a reference point. And what the piece does go through, Dennis, is a number of reasons why I think we're entering a tough time. One is the polarization in this country that we all know. If you think about it, after 9-11, there was, you know, everyone came together. We just went through an experience where a million people died, and instead of bringing us together, it pulled us apart. So that polarization in terms of making progress on problems has really stymied, uh, you know, issues like, well, we're running 7% deficit. We have over $35 trillion in debt. Neither political party has the will or uh, the willingness to address the problem uh, of deficits in this country. At some point in time, I think that is going to, to be demanded to be addressed. And the only way you can really solve a deficit of this magnitude is to cut spending and raise taxes. Well, what's that going to do to economic growth? Well, if the, if the economy slows over a period of 5, 10, 15 years, that's not going to justify extreme uh, evaluations that we're, we're seeing. Um, one thing I'll note, in the 1960s, $1 of debt generated 90 cents of GDP. Now, each dollar of debt generates about 30 cents of GDP. So we need more and more debt to generate the same level of economic activity. And finally, the monetary policy, the Fed used to govern monetary policy by always keeping the real funds rate positive. In other words, always was above the inflation rate. If they wanted to slow the economy, they'd raise it. If they wanted to get the economy going again, they'd narrow it. But it always was positive. And my point is, is that over the last 20 years, it spent most of the time being negative. The Fed, after the financial crisis in 2008 and pandemic, resorted to uh, quantitative easing. So to me, when I look at the two policy tools, fiscal and monetary policy, I believe both have lost their mojo to the extent that they were very effective in regulating the economy over the last 60, 70 years. What that means is if we go through a period of weakness, is the government going to be able to run huge deficits? And what will the Fed have to do to be able to uh, you know, support that? So those are all big time issues, Dennis, that don't get resolved in a matter of months. They take years. So I think those are two primary reasons why I think we're on the cusp of a secular bear market that will kick off as we go into the next recession, whenever that happens, but it will last anywhere from 10 to 15 years. So I just think investors need to understand that the investment strategy of buying and holding is great for secular bear markets in a secular, pardon me, bull markets. In bear markets, it does not work very well. And if you're older, 50, 60 years old, a 10 or 15 year secular bar market would be devastating to your retirement fund. So anyway, I, I just think I'm just trying to educate people. Uh, you know, what my what I do is tactical uh, investing, which I think is more appropriate for the kind of environment we're going to see over the next 10 to 15 years. But people can read the piece and judge for themselves whether or not the points made are valid. And I'll just give that email one more time. You can get both of those pieces for free, jimwelshmacro at gmail.com. So, Jim, you mentioned that, you know, your analysis uh, has stocks here uh, overvalued. I think the, the the Buffett indicator, which takes total market capitalization over GDP, shows that I think they're at the second highest point ever historically. Um, 
to what extent do you think this uh, this this Fed environment that you just described? You know, we didn't have real positive interest rates. We created this artificial environment. To what extent did that contribute, in your view, to the current level of stock valuations? Well, significantly. Uh, you know, if you have zero interest rates for an extended period of time, there's no cost of money. Corporations were able to go out and borrow money and then use a lot of that money to buy back stock. Uh, the mega cap stocks have tremendous cash flow. So not only were they able to borrow money cheap, but they could use that cash flow to reduce their floats. So that's one way uh, that has boosted. If you look at valuation models, many are based on well, what's the 10 year yield? Well, if the 10 year yields at 1%, that can support a much higher PE ratio. Uh, and that's what we saw. Again, though, evaluation is an important metric, but institutional investors need a reason to sell. And the main reason that causes them to sell are recessions or obviously some kind of financial event or geopolitical event that materially affects global GDP growth. So, you know, again, we need that trigger to really begin and usher in a period that I think is going to be more difficult. Uh, near term, uh, as I noted earlier, the advanced decline line is making a higher high. Back in 2007, the AD line made a peak in June of 2007. When the S&P made a higher high in October 2007, the AD line was weaker. That was one of the reasons why back then uh, I thought the market was in trouble, as well as, you know, I have a piece that describes my analysis from 2008 and 9 about the housing crisis and so forth. So, you know, what we're waiting for is the technical setup to show that the economy is weakening enough that it reflects itself in things like the advanced decline line in the overall market. So, Jim, let me shift gears here just a second, if I could, because uh, one of the big stories uh, of the year investing wise is uh, gold, I think, as we're recording, this is up about 30 percent year to date. One of the driving factors from my research is that central banks around the world, the very institutions in charge of monetary policy, seem to be loading up on gold. And that seems to be the driving force. And if you disagree with me, please say so. But uh, what, what are you what are you seeing as far as um, precious metals moving ahead? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked, Dennis. I, I think from the low we saw at around 1600, and I can't remember the exact date, wave one up, wave two bottom last year at 1812. Uh, I think we're nearing the end of wave three from that 1812 low. Positioning has gotten where uh, over 300,000 long positions are being held by large speculators. There was a short-term top in 2016, the top in 2020, same situation in terms of positioning. So I think my take is I'm looking for a pullback in gold, uh, potentially down 2,400, maybe 2,350. That would be wave four. And then I think gold makes a new run uh, to a higher high uh, after a near-term correction. So, you know, the central bank buying is like corporations buying their own stock. It provides an underlying bid to a market which limits, you know, the size of corrections. So, Jim, ultimately, um, let, let's look at the, the a major U.S. stock index like the S and P five hundred. Uh, is it a fair question to say where do you where do you see us going here, near term and then long term on the S and P? Um, yeah, it's a fair question. Uh, again, I'm not sure that we're top because the advanced decline line is still performing well. Near term, some of the momentum indicators that I use suggest we're on the cusp of a pullback. Um, I think if I'm right, that a recession event is coming or some kind of a banking issue, a decline to 4,100 uh, becomes you know, very likely. A drop to the October 22 low at 3,500 is coming. Now, if you look at prior bear markets, Dennis, as you know, nothing's a straight line. You go down, things get really overdone. You get big snapback rallies. You work your way lower. Those are chart supports. In other words, where prior lows came in, demand came in, those become targets during a bear phase. Ultimately, the low that we saw in 2020 at around 2200 
would become a target during a secular bear market. This thing doesn't happen overnight. It unfolds over time as the economy struggles, other issues are dealt with, you know, income inequality. You asked about monetary policy, wealth inequality. There is no question in my mind that monetary policy has played a big role in creating those two very significant problems. They're going to be tough to wrestle with, um, but those are the things that are dealt with during a secular bear market. Well, Jim, unfortunately, the clock says that we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, my guest today has been Mr. Jim Welsh. His website, macrotides.com. Jim's also offering a couple of free reports to the listeners today. The 17-year cycle and the coming secular bear market are the two reports. You can email Jim at jimwelshmacro at gmail.com, and he'll be glad to send you the reports. Jim, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Appreciate your perspective and uh, and your research. Love to have you back down the road. Be happy to join you, Dennis, and thank you. You you did a great job, in my view, of asking great questions. It explains to me why you have uh, pretty good success in terms of the number of people who tune in. Good questions ideally lend to, hopefully, helpful answers. So thank you for having me. Happy to come back again and appreciate the opportunity. Well, I appreciate those nice words as well. And we will return after these words. I'm Dennis Tuberg, and this is RLA Radio. Glad you decided to tune in today. Thanks again to my special guest, Mr. Jim Welsh, for joining us on today's program as well. If you're just tuning in or you haven't yet done so, I'd like to encourage you to go to requestyourreport.com. When you go to requestyourreport.com, you can request this month's book offer. I'm offering the best-selling book from 2021 titled Retirement Roadmap. Retirement Roadmap contains some tax planning strategies as it relates to your IRA or 401k. These strategies are still applicable and available for the next couple tax years. So to get your Retirement Roadmap book being offered during the month of October only, go to requestyourreport.com and let me know where to mail the report and I'll be very glad to do so. You know, we've all heard that the American consumer is resilient. The American consumer continues to drive the U.S. economy. And of course, for the U.S. economy to be healthy, for the U.S. economy to grow, consumers have to spend money because the U.S. economy is more than 70% dependent on consumer spending. Now, however, there's some data that makes me think that Americans collectively may be getting close to hitting their credit card limits. Now, this is based on the latest consumer credit card data from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve noted that Total household debt now stands at $17.8 trillion. And credit card debt actually contracted by 1.2% during the month of August. Now, this was the biggest decline in credit card debt since March of 2021, which was when the economic shutdowns started. That's when the savings rate went up. That's when there was helicopter money, if you will, distributed to many American consumers. So we saw this past August, credit card debt contract by 1.2%. Now, overall consumer debt went up 2.1% during the month of August. Now that's $8.9 billion in new debt in one month. Now, the $8.9 billion in consumer debt that was actually added was much lower than the $11.8 billion forecast. Total consumer debt now is $5.1 trillion, according to the Federal Reserve. Now, that $5.1 trillion includes credit card debt, it includes student loan debt, it includes auto loan debt, but does not include mortgage debt. So when you add credit card debt, student loan debt, and auto loan debt all together, 
it's over five trillion dollars. That is just slightly less than twenty percent of the entire output of the U.S. economy. Now, if you include mortgages, the numbers get even more staggering. When you include mortgages, U.S. households are literally buried under a record level of debt. At the end of the second quarter of 2024, total household debt stood at $17.8 trillion, almost $18 trillion in household debt. Well, now when you take a look at credit card debt contracting and you look at total household debt levels, it tells you that there is a very high probability that American consumers have reached their collective credit limit. And when the debt in the system reaches its capacity for the system to service the debt, deflation ensues. Let me put that another way. When total debt in the economy gets to the point that no additional debt can be serviced, we have a recession. Now, keep in mind, today's currency is debt. When the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates, when the Federal Reserve reduces interest rates, they do so to encourage borrowing. And as people borrow money and deposit that newly borrowed money in another institution, and that institution loans money, by virtue of the fact that money is moving, more money is created. Well, with almost $18 trillion in consumer debt, it tells you that this trend will have to reverse. That will put the U.S. economy, in my opinion, into a recession. And I believe that is one of the reasons that the Federal Reserve likely cut interest rates. Now, interestingly, when the Fed cut interest rates back on September 18. Since that time, mortgage rates have been going up. How can that be? Well, last week, Bloomberg reported that U.S. mortgage rates jumped by the most since July of 2023. A 30-year mortgage interest rate increased about a quarter point to now about 6.4%. That is the highest level since August. Refinancing numbers dropped as a result of interest rates rising. Mortgage rates tend to track U.S. Treasuries. U.S. Treasury interest rates are reflective of the credit rating of the U.S. government. And I probably don't need to say any more than that. As you're planning for retirement, I would encourage you to get all the resources that you can get. I would encourage you to do your own research. And to that end today, I am offering the Retirement Roadmap book that is yours by visiting the website requestyourreport.com. Let me know where to mail that book, and I'll be very glad to do so absolutely free. Again, the website requestyourreport.com. And if you've not yet done so, go to Retirement Lifestyle Advocates and create a free login for our website. You'll get access to the podcast, the headline roundup newscast, and the weekly newsletter absolutely free. That website, again, is retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. That's all the time I have for this week. Glad you listened in. I'll be back again next week.